الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما نافعا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أوحي إلي أنه استمع نفر من الجن فقالوا إنا سمعنا قرآنا عجبا يهدي إلى الرشد فآمنا به ولن نشرك بربنا أحدا وأنه تعالى جد ربنا ما اتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا وأنه كان يقول سفيهنا على الله شططا وأنا ظننا أن لن تقول الإنس والجن على الله كذبا وأنه كان رجال من الإنس يعوذون برجال من الجن فزادوهم رهقا وأنهم ظنوا كما ظننتم أن لن يبعث الله أحدا إلى آخر الآيات We completed Surah Nuh and Surah Nuh if we recall we went over in the last two weeks was the, the invitation of Nuh السلام, to his people and the warnings that he gave and eventually his a supplication against his people and their destruction so basically if if this if the whole incident of Nuh alayhi salam's uh, invitation his da'wa his prayer to Allah and eventually the destruction of his people who disbelieved in him if you if that is related to the people of Mecca who were the first a group of individuals who were addressed with the Quran, then this would be considered a form of tarheeb. Tarheeb meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warning them. That look, th- this, these were the people of Nuh alayhi salam, and look at how they responded to the invitation of Nuh alayhi salam and what happened to them. What is the result of kufr? Disbelieving in Allah and denying the messenger of Allah. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by revealing the, the, the surah of Nuh, surah Nuh, would be warning the disbelievers of Mecca. And it becomes a warning for all disbelievers that this would be the consequence of kufr. So this, the whole surah of surah Nuh, we can say is the surah of tarheeb. Tarheeb meaning warning of the consequences of kufr. Followed by Tarheeb, usually the Qur'an brings these two uh, themes together, coupled together. Tarheeb and Tarheeb. Tarheeb means to encourage. Tarheeb means to warn. Right? The carrot and the stick. Right? How they say in English. Right? To encourage, motivate. To mention fada'il, virtues. So that people are motivated to believe, to perform righteous actions. And also to warn, to create fear of the consequences of disbelief, disobedience. Uh, so these two themes usually go together in the Quran. So likewise here, Surah Nu would be considered Tarheeb, warning. Surah Jinn is Tarheeb now. Right? It's to motivate, to encourage human beings, right, that oh humans, Kuffar of Makkah. Right, initially, and then all humans who disbelieve, 
O oh, humans who are created from soil, dust, clay, right? The origins of the human who are supposed to be humble, right? The human from clay, dust, soil, from the earth should have humbleness in themselves and submit to Allah and believe in Allah and believe in the messengers of Allah. There sh they, human beings should be inclined to believe more than the jinn the jinn whose origin is fire, which usually is elevated, which rises, which has uh, very little inclination towards submission and humbleness. In spite of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, look at these jinn who are nariyul asl, their origin is fire, they have this elevation in them, in their uh, personality, if you want to say, in their temperament. In spite of that, they humbled themselves. When they heard the Qur'an and they became Muslim. Why are you not becoming Muslim, O oh humans? You should be accepting the truth uh, more so than the jinn. And the jinn accepted Islam. So the whole surah was revealed. And this is why it's, uh, it's named Surah Al-Jinn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses the, uh, a specific incident that occurred. That the Prophet ﷺ himself was not aware of. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed the Prophet sallallahu of this incident uh, uh, of jinn listening to the Qur'an. But before we get there, we start discussing the surah, right? It's always good to talk about jinn. People like talking about jinn. It's a very nice book. Um, I just started reading it. I wish I had time to go through all of it. It's called Akamul Marjan fi Ahkamil Jan. Akamul Marjan fi Ahkamil Jan. Very nice book. It's written by Sheikh Al Allama Badruddin Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Abdullah Shibli. Muhammad ibn Abdullah Shibli. He was an 8th century scholar. In 769, he passed away. Hijrah. We're in 1446, 769 almost 700 years ago. He wrote a book, um, not very extensive, but Akamul Marjan fi Ahkam al Jan related to the rulings of jinn. Jan is the plural for jinn. Right? And he speaks um, about all sorts of things. He has about 140 chapters in the book. And I'll, I'll, just to get an idea of what he has covered in the book about jinn, um, in his index, or if you want to call it the table of contents, he, he discusses, uh, I won't go through all 140, but just to get an idea of what discussions, and this discussions are not lengthy, very short. I believe this book is translated to in Urdu. I'm not sure if it's translated in English. But uh, in chapter number one, Fi Bayani Ithbat al Jinn wal Khilafi fi. In uh, explaining or ex uh, discussing whether jinn exists or not, and the difference that, of opinions that people had in the past, even now regarding the existence of jinn. Do they even exist? There are some people who don't believe the existence of jinn. And surprisingly, there were some Muslim sects, the, some of the Mu'tazilites, right, in the early 2nd, 3rd century, um, the Qadriya, these were deviant sects within Islam. They ended up rejecting the existence of jinn, whereas the Qur'an explicitly speaks about the jinn, and therefore... Um, the scholars of the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they say to deny the existence of jinn would lead a person to disbelief. Kufr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran explicitly speaks about them and their existence. So their existence is established by the Quran, meaning it's with absolute certainty that the jinn exist. They are a creation just like we are a creation of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hundreds of thousands of different species and creations that he has created. From amongst them are the jinn. 
So he speaks about the, the, this, uh, the philosophers, atheists, they don't believe in the, the spiritual realm, right? For them, existence is only that which they can perceive with their sensory perception, their five senses. Um, but, you know, there's no rational reason, right? A, a valid rational argument that could be used to reject and deny their existence. Rationally, it's possible for such beings to exist. And through revelation, it is confirmed that they do exist. And therefore, there's no doubt regarding their existence, that jinn exist. And then he goes on to speak the second chapter, fi ibtida'i khalqil jinn, the initi initial creation of the jinn. The jinn were created before humans. So they precede us on earth. We're not the first ones here. There were people, there were before us, creations and who knows maybe the dinosaurs were around in the jinn's time right um, they were the animals that they used to ride or they were existent then but um, some narrations say uh, they existed they were created 2,000 years before humans and the jinns were living on earth 2,000 years before humans were sent on earth and some people say 40 years before um, and this is why the narrations about the whole incident of the creation of the first human being, Adam alayhi salam, and the instruction, command by, uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prostrate to Adam, the commentators say this instruction, uh, this command was not just to the angels, it was also a command given to the jinn that were present with the angels. And all the angels and all the jinn prostrated except for one who is famously known as Iblis. Iblis is one from the jinn, right? Um, so they existed before human beings. The third chapter, he has, anna asla al -jin anna, that the origin of jinn, like human, be the origin of humans, is primarily from soil. The soil of the earth, different uh, soils, uh, types of soil from all over the earth was gathered, and Adam alayhi salam's uh, his, his statue was formed with that soil. This is the origin of the human, of us, right? Whereas the origin of the jinn is from fire, right? Smokeless fire. That's the origin of jinn. That's what they were created from. Possibly with other mixture, but this was their primary ingredient. Like the primary um, substance that was used for the creation of the human was soil and dirt. Uh, third chapter, fourth chapter, Ajusamul Jinn, what kind of bodies they have. Very interesting. He speaks about how the forms that jinns can take, they usually are in the forms of, they can, when they come in uh, other forms, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed them. And not that they uh, completely can change on their own, their original form, but rather they have certain ways or certain recitations they recite by which they can assume like through sorcery through a type of magic they can assume these different forms they come in the forms of dogs snakes and many other animals sometimes in the form of humans they come right and he brings narrations like um, um, at the time of um, Darun Nadwa when the Mushrikun Right, they gathered to decide um, what they should do with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at the time of migration, they had gathered and to consult one another, all the leaders of Mecca. And there was one elderly man who gave the opinion, and right? he said he was a sheikh from Najd, Sheikhun Najdi. Najd is a very questionable place. The Shaykh al-Najdi, very old, wise man, gave this opinion that, you know, the only way you could resolve this issue is to assassinate him. That's the only way. And they all said, how can we do this? If anyone assassinates him, the, the, his family, Banu Hashim, will take revenge from that individual and their tribe and their family. He said, it's easy. One person from each tribe should uh, be appointed for this uh, mission. And Banu Hashim can't. Uh, go to war with every tribe and they said yeah that makes sense right this is a good idea 
and they prepared individuals from every tribe. So that shaykh who was giving this opinion, no one knew who he was. And in narrations it comes, that was shaitan, who had come in the form of this elderly wise man. Shaitan always comes in the form of, form of wise man, right? And to instill some wisdom of his into humans. And there are other occasions too. On the day of Badr, he was seen, right? He came in the form of Suraqa ibn Malik, right? Shaitan. And he convinced the disbelievers to proceed, right? That, you know, you will be victorious over the believers. Don't go back. So the jinn acquiring different forms. The types of jinn, fi bayani asnafil jinn, bayani tatawwuril jinn wa tashakkulihim, how they go into different forms. Ba'd al kilab min al jinn, dogs are also, many of them are uh, jinns in the form of dogs. Bayani masakin al jinn, where do the jinns live? Fima yamna'u shayateen min al babit bi manazil al ins, how they are prohibited from staying in the homes of humans. The jinns are prohibited. They, there are many exclusive rulings for jinn, right? That they can't do this, they can't do this. They cannot uh, enter into a human's home, right? Um, but many jinn do. They enter into the homes of humans, although they're not permitted to, just like many humans do many things that they're not permitted to do, right? We, as humans, we do many things that we're not allowed to do. Likewise, jinn. And even more so, the jinn. There is more evil in jinn than good. So they also do many things that they're not allowed to, right? Going to homes, right? Um, um, they eat from the food of humans. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, when a person enters the home and he doesn't take the name of Allah, he doesn't say, Allahumma inni as'aluka khayr al mawlij wa khayr al makhraj, bismillah wa lajna wa yusna wa lajna. Uh, and and the assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah he doesn't say the tasmiya bismillah then the 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 shayateen entered the home with him like it's like he's opened the door for the the evil jinn evil because they're not allowed to but when a person does not take the name of allah then they have an opportunity if he takes the name of allah then those evil jinn can't come into the home likewise the prophet sallam said when a person is eating right once the prophet sallam was eating with a group of Sahaba عنهم, and a, a maid, a jariya, came and wanted to take some of the food. And the Prophet stopped her. Another Bedouin came and he wanted to take some of the food and the Prophet stopped him too and held his hand. And then the Prophet said to the Sahaba عنهم, that we all were eating in the name of Allah, but Shaitan wanted to take part in this food and he couldn't because everyone took the name of Allah. But this individual and this woman, they attempted to eat without the name of Allah and shaitan was about to eat with them. But I caught them. And this, this uh, Bedouin's hand, which I'm holding, I'm also holding the shaitan's hand with him. Like I have grabbed him and I'm not allowing him to eat. So there are uh, narrations that show that, the, and the Prophet ﷺ says that when you don't take the name of Allah, then shaitan also takes part in the food. And obviously when shaitan is eating with us, how can there be blessings in that food? Right? So people don't realize this. Right? They eat, they eat, eat without tasmiyah, without the remembrance of Allah, and they don't realize that they're losing blessings and the shaitan is with them. And you can just imagine the effects of that food on them, right? which is associated with the shaitan. Likewise, there are many other, uh, likewise, he speaks about this. He speaks about where they live. Uh, they eat and drink. Shaitan yakulu wa yashrabu bi shimalihi. He eats with his left hand. فَمَا يَمْنَعُ الْجِنْ مِنْ تَنَاوُلِ طَعَامِ الْإِنسِ What we just spoke about. يَتَنَاكَحُونَ وَيَتَنَاسَلُونَ They also get married with one another. And they have children, the jinn. They have progenies um, and they have very long lives. He mentions a narration in here from uh, Ibn al Jawzi, who narrates from Sahal ibn Abdullah to study, I believe, uh, earlier centuries, maybe second, third century. He says once he was in the Haram and he saw a very old man, you know, very uh, illuminating, saw like light emanating from him. He was wearing uh, a woolen, looking very old cloak. And he approached him and, and he said salam and he engaged in conversation and, he, and the, the man responded by 
saying that, are you surprised with the radiance and the state of my cloak? And he said, I, I have met Isa alayhi salam. It's almost 700 years ago. And I was also from those jinn who met the Prophet sallallahu and accepted Islam at his hands. Right? And this is like two or three hundred years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So like he was living for over seven centuries, this jinn. So many of them, they have very long lives. Um, uh, they are mukallaf anna al-jinna mukallafoon bi ajma'i ahlin nadar that the jinn are the only creation along with the humans that are responsible for their actions. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take them to account for their deeds, good or evil. And this is why um, in Surah Al-Rahman, the, the humans and the jinn both are addressed. And this is Ya Ma'ashar al Jinni wal Ins. O species of jinn and ins, which of the favors of your Lord will both of you deny? The whole surah addresses. So the jinn are also just like humans, mukallaf, meaning they are responsible for their actions. They are responsible to believe, to be Muslim. Right? So the believers from them will be uh, rewarded in the form of paradise and the disbelievers from them will be punished in their jahannam whatever form of jahannam they have um were there prophets from the jinn what is the opinion of the scholars was there any a prophet from the jinn the majority say that uh, there was no specific prophet that was from the jinn sent to the jinn but rather the jinn are all obligated to follow the prophet of their time so the jinn of our time are obligated to follow the Prophet Muhammad And this is why they met the Prophet many times. Um, what we just mentioned. القرآن, he has a chapter uh, regarding what we will discuss inshallah under this surah that the a group of jinn going to the prophet sallallahu and listening to the quran from the prophet sallallahu the jinn meeting the prophet sallallahu in makkah as well as medina this was one occasion that will be discussed in the surah where the jinn they heard the prophet sallallahu alaihi reciting quran but there were occasions because this led to many of them accepting islam and after they accepted islam they came to the prophet sallallahu multiple times after this incident, after they accepted Islam and uh, in Mecca as well as in Medina and some of the Sahaba, especially Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu he narrates once, this was in Medina, when one night the Prophet ﷺ took him out at night towards Baqi, the graveyard, and the Prophet ﷺ drew a circle and he told Abdullah ibn Mas'ud to stay in that circle, to so don't come out of this circle. And then the Prophet ﷺ went further ahead into the, the trees or the bushes. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he narrates that I wanted to see where the Prophet ﷺ was going. I heard some noise, some loud uh, voices, and I was scared that it's possible that uh, some of the enemy might uh, ambush the Prophet ﷺ and attack him. I went to see and I saw these uh, figures that were very dark, right? And the Prophet ﷺ was addressing them. He had a staff in his hand and he actually started raising his voice uh, with them. And then Abdullah ibn Mas'ud thought that this could be the enemies of the Prophet. Let me go and inform people. And then he remembered. The Prophet ﷺ told me not to leave this circle. So he stayed in the circle. And the Prophet ﷺ eventually came back before the morning and he asked him, did you fall asleep here? And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, how could I? And all this noise was happening. and I, I was afraid of what might happen to you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you didn't leave the circle, you stayed here. And he said, yes, he's, because he said, if you would have left, possibly they would have taken you away. You would have disappeared, right? So this is also, well, people, he experienced this, right? One of our teachers, not, I didn't study from directly, but uh, my brother studied from him and he was, he just passed away recently. Uh, he was teaching Bukhari, uh, Sahih al-Bukhari in, in Dewsbury in England. Malana Muslihuddin, very famous, uh, the, those who know him from India. He had, uh, 
I, th- I believe, four brothers. And he mentions in, in one of his books, in his autobiographies, he, sa- he speaks about his brothers and he says, one of my brothers, um, you know, in his young age while he was studying, um, the jinn took him and he never came back. He had a very nice voice. He used to read the Quran very nice. So, and the jinn took him and we never uh, found him after that, right? And he never returned. So he, he, there, there are incidents like this too. So uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud uh, was protected because of that uh, circle that the Prophet had made, possibly recited something so that the jinn would not have access to him. Um, sometimes the jinns, they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala along with humans. So, like, if you might have some abnormal experience here in the masjid, don't get scared. They're just our brothers. They might be standing with us. And <laughs> No, there are jinns around this area too. For your information. Right? We, we experienced one upstairs. But anyways... So they could be uh, worshiping. That's possible. They worship with humans. They come in their uh, in, in a form that cannot be seen, and sometimes they may come in human form. Uh, they also study with humans sometimes, right? But again, they're not allowed to. It's prohibited for them to disturb humans. So those who disturb humans are usually the evil ones. They transgress. Uh, it's something haram that they do. And they will be punished for it if they don't repent, right? They're not allowed to disturb humans. They're, they sometimes possess humans, right? Um, this is where we experienced when I was there. There was a young girl, may Allah protect her. Uh, and this also uh, leads to the fact that the, the Prophet Sallallahu he has taught us, right, um, prayers, and, and he also mentions one of them here and the, the, the last two surahs of the Quran, Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas. These are very effective in the morning and evening prayers as well as the five daily prayers that we perform. Right? These are ways to protect ourselves from these evil jinn uh, uh, being able to uh, influence us or affect us right? in, in any way. There are so many du'as that we have been taught. Um, we don't realize the importance of these du'as, right? Uh, like, for example, going into the washroom. We are taught to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubuthi wal khaba'ith. Right? And the, the meaning of this du'a is, Allah, protect me from filth and the evil jinn, al-khaba'ith. Because the evil jinn, they like to lurk around uh, unclean areas, filthy areas. Right? The evil jinn, they like filth. They like impurity, right? Um, najasa. And when a person is around impurity, filth, right? There is a chance that he might be affected, afflicted by these evil jinn. So this is why when the dua is recited, the jinn are not able to affect the person while they're in this place. Um, likewise, we were mentioning these duas, Right? Um, that when a person recites their du'as morning and evening, they perform their prayers, um, then the jinn, are, this is usually a defense against any evil from the jinn. Uh, and this is also with the qudrat of Allah. Obviously, we recite the du'a, but Allah is the protector, right? Uh, and through the permission and through the protection of Allah, a person is protected. And Allah will protect the person who recites these du'as and performs their prayers and remains clean as much as possible. But those who neglect these uh, du'as and they don't understand the significance of them and they don't regularly pray and they stay in the state of impurity, they are easy targets for the jinn, right? Um, uh, Like those people who engage frequently in, um, you know, there was an incident I think once I mentioned regarding... uh, a young girl that was being treated for jinn possession and she was she was mentioning how like when she is possessed she can see the other jinn who are in the home and uh, a, a, a close relative of mine 
was the one who was treating the family and he was saying that sometimes she would speak about the jinn and, and what she saw and she would say that um, within my home I could see that the, the largest number of jinn would be present in the home when someone would be watching a horror movie inside the house. That's when there would be the most jinn, right, in the home. So, like, this exposure to the television and the, the, these type of movies also invites the jinn. It's like a portal through which they come, right? So this is, these are very dangerous uh, situations too. So, uh, mentioning how uh, experienced uh, a lady upstairs who had come, and clearly, when she was speaking, it was not her that was speaking. It was someone else who had possessed her. And the, the jinn that was speaking through her voice, this girl's voice, was saying, no, I'm not going to leave her alone. Right? And the imam, I don't know if I mentioned our imam, mashallah, he was addressing the jinn and saying that, you know, leave, and he was reciting his uh, ruqya, and the jinn was adamant and no, I'm not going to leave her alone. I'm, I'm going to bother her every day. So these, this happens sometimes. And they, sometimes they need to go through treatment. Sometimes ruqya helps. And this becomes a, a type of uh, tribulation, a trial. Right? Just like, our, uh, like, like physical illnesses. Right? They're a test for us. Right? Sometimes we fall into physical illness. A person gets cancer, may Allah protect us, right? A person gets these different types of diseases and they become a test for a person, right? A test of their patience and uh, sometimes it becomes a means of turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So likewise, these type of afflictions are also a test for the human being, right? Obviously, the jinn who would uh, commit this would be committing a wrong, but it becomes a test for the human too, right? And it, it's not something very... Uh, we don't we don't want to experience this. So this is why we should seek Allah's protection for ourselves, for our families, for our children. And you know, from what it seems and what we are hear, hearing people say, and even scholars, that the the mischief of the jinn has increased a lot throughout the world now. There is a lot of jinn uh, um, activity amongst humans now. Right? We don't realize it, but there's a lot of activity going on, right? And um, you know, those who have understanding and those who uh, sometimes are exposed to this, they realize this. And this is why it's extremely important now for us to be well protected through the du'as that we are taught in the hadith. Um, very important for us to um, take our precaution, right? And, and defend ourselves from the evil that may exist around us. Fi hukmi salat khalf al jinni. Are you allowed to perform a prayer behind a jinn? Can a jinn be imam? Right? He discusses this. In iqadul jama'ati bihim. What if a jinn crosses in front of a human while he's praying? What's the ruling regarding that? What if a, 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 a human kills a jinn? Um, can a person get married to a jinn? Munakahatul jinn. I'm not sure how that works, right? But um, he speaks about jinn affliction. Uh, if a jinn takes away uh, a, a human being, right? Discussion regarding that. What are they allowed to eat? Um, to advise jinns, to address them, right? Who knows? We, we reach out to them too, right? to give advice to them, إِذَا Jinn. The Prophet ﷺ, he went, like we said, on multiple occasions, and he gave khutbah to them, he advised them, he spoke to them, right? they had questions, he answered those questions. وَغَيْرُ um, Many other aspects he deals with. Um, he deals with also the possession of jinn, إِخْبَارُ um, الْجِنْ How jinn, they informed of the Prophet ﷺ's prophethood. Some of the Sahaba themselves mentioned after accepting Islam that we inform, we were informed by a jinn of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi inviting people towards Islam. A jinn had informed us. 
uh, the jinn's uh, participation or their information regarding the Battle of Badr, uh, the, the shahadat of some of the Sahaba, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, jinn's informed of his demise. I just want to get to the last part where he speaks about um, yeah, their interaction with many different prophets also. But in the conclusion of this book, he mentions how um, they are a great test for humans. Right? He says, قَالَ أَبُوا الْفَرَجِ بْنُ الْجَوْزِ where he says, فِي التَّحْذِيرِ مِنْ فِتَنِ الشَّيْطَانِ وَمَا كَائِدِي So usually, the, the evil jinn are referred to as the shayateen, right? So the jinn is a broad category, right? just like the human beings. And then from the humans, you have those who are good, righteous, and sometimes they may be believers, they may be disbelievers, but they're not evil people, right? They're good people, but they just do not believe. Likewise, amongst the jinn are the believers and then the disbelievers. And then even from amongst the disbelievers, there are different types of jinn, right? And those that are uh, um, like extremely evil and they are the ones that um, bother humans, they, they have uh, like conflicts and wars amongst them, um, they are usually referred to as the shayateen, the evil jinn, right? The evil spirits. And then you have the good jinn too, right? So um, like Iblis is also a jinn. He's from the same species as jinn, but he became the most evil of them, right? The, his progeny that came down, they say that the, the first jinn was called al-jan. Like just the first human being was Adam alayhi salam. The first jinn was al-jan. That was his name. And there's another name he mentions there too. He was abul jinn. Like from, all jinns came from him. Like all humans came from Adam alayhi salam. So Iblis is just one amongst them who ended up becoming the worst from them, right? And be cursed till eternity. So, um, and then he has his progeny, his minions, they are the shayateen. Just like there are shayateen from the jinn, there's also shayateen from the ins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, shayateen ul insi wal jinn. That the shaitan from humans and the shaitan from jinn. So the most evil human beings could also be referred to as the shayateen from humans. And likewise, the shayateen from the jinn. So he says, the warning regarding the fitna of shaitan and his tricks. Abu al-Faraj ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah. And in the same ibn al-Jawzi has a whole book on the tricks of shaitan. Talbisu iblis. Right? The, the tricks and the trickery and the deception of iblis. And how he deceives different people in different ways different types of people, scholars, laymen, rich, poor, right? And he has tricks for everyone, right? And he tricks them in different ways. So this deception of the shaitan, he speaks about it at the end, a small paragraph, and he says, When the human being was created, Allah put in the human passions, desires. And Allah put in the human being, uh, so put in the human being passions and desires, so that through that nature, natural instinct, he could acquire that which benefits. So there is a reason for having these passions and desires, to uh, strive for and acquire and obtain that which is beneficial for us. It's that nature within us that drives us to look for that which is beneficial, that by which we can fulfill our needs and necessities. If this uh, hawa and shahwa did not exist, then uh, we would not be motivated to fulfill those needs of ours through this desire and passion. And Allah also put ghadab, anger, within the human being as part of the human nature, so that with it, a person could repel that which is harmful. That's the reason for that natural instinct of anger and dislike so that a person can repel from himself that which may harm him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave intellect to the human. That the intellect is what governs 
these two natural instincts of the human, right? The passion as well as the anger, how to utilize them to acquire and refrain from that which is helpful and that which is harmful. So the aql governs a person in doing what is helpful and, and, and beneficial and refraining from what is harmful. The aql will help an individual make those decisions and remain moderate. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then created shaitan. وَخَلَقَ الشَّيْطَانِ مُحَرِّضًا لَهُ عَلَى الْإِسْرَافِ فِي اجْتِنَابِهِ وَاجْتِنَابِهِ To test the human in going astray in, these, in regards to these two natural instincts. In regards to his shahwa and his ghadab. To take him to do things that are not permitted in fulfilling his desires. And uh, engaging in things that he should refrain from. But his ghadab should have repelled. But shaitan tricks him and uh, gets him involved in those things. So that's the test of shaitan for the human being. So he says, فَالْوَاجِبُ عَلَى الْعَاقِلَ أَنْ يَأْخُذَ حَذْرَهُ مِنْ هَذَا الْعَدُو So the intellectual, intelligent person, the intellectual, it is necessary upon him to be cautious of this enemy. That he doesn't allow this enemy, meaning the evil shaitan, to lead him astray in regards to these natural instincts that he possesses. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear. قَدْ أَبَانَ عَدَاوَتَهُ مِنْ زَمَنِ آدَمْ وَقَدْ بَذَلَ نَفْسَهُ وَعُمْرَهُ فِي إِفْسَادِ أَحْوَالِ بَنِي آدَمْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear to Adam alayhi salam that shaitan is your enemy till the day of judgment. And he will be your enemy and the enemy of your progeny. Every human being is an enemy to shaitan. Right? And the evil jinn. And they will do whatever is possible to lead the humans astray and lead the humans to destruction. Because they, they like, you know, extremely dislike and hate the humans, these evil jinn, right? Because shaitan blames a human for what happened to him. It's because of you that God cursed me. So I'm going to destroy you and your progeny. And this is a promise he made to Allah that I'm going to lead the humans astray and to destruction. Thus Allah warns in the Quran, لا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان Don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. He is a clear enemy to you. إنما يأمركم بالسوء والفحشاء He will command you to commit evil and indecency. الشيطان يعيدكم الفقر Allah, uh, Shaitan makes you fear poverty and he stops you from giving your money and charity and being generous. ويريد الشيطان أن يضلهم Shaitan wishes to lead you astray. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ يُوْقِعَ بَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءِ Shaitan wishes to cause amongst you hatred and enmity so that you fight one another and you go to war with one another. You know, human beings fighting for small reasons. That's when you see that shaitan must be between these two people, causing them to fight between husband and wife. He loves it, the conflicts between husband and wives. Most of them are through the instigation of shaitan. إِنَّهُ عَدُوٌ مُضِلٌ مُبِينٌ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ Allah says very clearly, Shaitan is your enemy, فَاتَّخِذُوهُ عَدُوًا Keep him your enemy, make him your enemy. So in this way, um, he warns regarding the maka'id. And finally, he mentions at the end of this book, in Sahihain, Imam Muslim, Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, both narrate this hadith from Abdullah ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعوذ الحسن والحسين the Prophet ﷺ would read ta'awwud, meaning would seek Allah's protection for Hassan and Hussein, his nephews. Fatima radiallahu anha, Ali radiallahu anhu's sons, Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhuma, they were the beloved of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ loved both of them. And to protect them from the shaitan and his influence, uh, the Prophet ﷺ would do ta'awwud, meaning would seek Allah's protection for both Hassan and Hussein with these words. And he would say, I put both of you in the protection of Allah or tamati with those complete words of Allah min kulli shaitanin wahamma wa min kulli aynin lamma. Very famous dua. Min kulli shaitanin wahamma wa min kulli aynin lamma. 
that I put you two in the protection of Allah from every shaitan with his beautiful kalimat and complete kalimat and words from every shaitan and every poisonous and harmful creature and every eye that will cause harm. You know, people get afflicted with the eye, nazar, from every uh, uh, eye that may cause harm. So this dua he would recite. And we also mention the mu'awwadatayn were revealed also for this purpose. So this is a little introduction and awareness of the jinn, right? And there's a lot more. Again, this book has so much about the jinn. This surah, Surah Al-Jinn, is going to speak about an incident that occurred uh, between the jinn and their interaction with the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi and his reciting the Qur'an. InshaAllah, we'll continue next week. Subhanallah, alhamdi, subhanakallahu, wa bihamdika, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, Allahumma laka alhamdu kulluhu, wa laka al-shukru kullu, Allahumma laka alhamdu bil-iman, wa laka alhamdu bil-islam, wa laka alhamdu bil-Qur'an, wa laka alhamdu bil-ahli wal-mali wal-mu'afa, Allahumma la nuhsi thana'an alayk, anta kama athnayta ala nafsik, يا رب صل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من كل شيطان وهام اللهم إنا نعوذ بك, بك نعوذ بك بكلمات الله بكلماتك التامات من كل شيطان وهام ومن كل عين لام اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من الفتن ما ظهر منها وما بطن ونعوذ بك من يوم السوء ومن ليلة السوء ومن ساعة السوء ومن صاحب السوء اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من إبليس وجنوده اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من إبليس وجنوده اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من إبليس وجنوده والله we seek your protection from Iblis and his army. Allah protect us, our families, our children, our progeny to come. Allah protect the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, from the tribulations of Iblis and his army. Allah protect us, guide us, Allah keep us steadfast. Allah protect the whole Ummah and guide the Ummah. Forgive the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, Shower your mercy upon the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم. Oh Allah, the evil that is being spread, O oh Allah, through humans as well as jinn, O oh Allah, put an end to that evil, O oh Allah. Establish justice on earth, O oh Allah. Eliminate falsehood from the earth, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, guide all of humanity towards the truth, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, make us a means of being steadfast on the truth and guiding others to the truth, O oh Allah. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Innaka anta sami'ul alim wa tub alayna. Innaka anta tawabur rahim. Wa sallillahumma wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa rahmatika ya Allah.